uh, I'm reminded of uh, one thing. When uh, Britishers left India, huh. they gave us this, uh, you know, the, the taste of tea. I huh. mean, tea was uh, handed over to India. Indians didn't know about tea drinking and all that. It was all milk here in India. Yeah. And, you know, there was a time when, you know, the, the tea companies will come to the cities huh. and they will come with, you know, all the preparations and they will offer free a cup of tea to anyone who goes near their vehicle and all that. So yeah. they just ask you to taste this. And now the tea is, you know, <laughs> you can't do anything without tea in the morning. And the same is the case with mobile. I mean, this is something which we have got from the U.S. You know, so <laughs> these are the challenges that uh, the... Uh, so you started... You started with the cultural diplomacy on the as an anecdote here. Like yeah, yeah. we got everything, uh, like yeah. the taste of tea and yeah, how yeah. It, tea is a very important factor uh, for yeah. India in yeah, yeah. relations to its cultural diplomacy. Like so, like in case of India UAE's relation, yeah. uh, where in which I did my PhD, I actually have uh, worked on India's cultural diplomacy with uh, UAE. So yeah. I actually have uh, a, like how Karak Chai and Suleimani Chai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I am reminded of, you know, a uh, uh, typical uh, cup of tea in Indore. They yeah. have a very small cup, very small cup. Hmm. You can say a mini cup. Ah. And uh, the tea, it is known as Gulabi Chai. Gulabi Chai, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's so tasty, but... When I asked someone in Indore, I was at Gwale, so I used to go to Indore, and I asked, why this uh, small cup, why don't you have a, I mean, sufficiently big cup? No, yeah. they, we uh, drink tea throughout the day. If we drink from, you know, uh, bigger cups, uh, it will be, create problems for us. I mean, uh, hygienic and all that, I mean, it will upset our tummy and all that. So we just prefer this uh, small, I mean, just a, uh, you know, just two drops, I mean, of tea that will keep us you know uh, alive for the whole day and all that so so many things are there and now you know have that pullar wala chai you know it's very popular it's and, it, uh, yeah yeah i come from state of kolkata in kolkata also there is a very strong tea culture yeah yeah i mean it's near to assam i mean <laughs> so i come from it. west Bengal, so i come from kolkata and kolkata like every street has a chai ka dukan where there is political discussion so that's like a culture in calcutta actually uh, they are known as tea addas you know tea addas, tea addas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. many friends from uh, uh, calcutta has told me that uh, uh, there they will sit and just uh, talk about politics and politics. you know uh, if you I don't think you remember about the crowd place in Delhi. How what you I... see, yeah, what you see now that the, the metro station and that the market is there. You know, there was a time when uh, there was a coffee house here and it was running tents and journalists, uh, academics, students, researchers, they used to come to this uh, coffee shop and it was very popular, just suppose at Regal. I yeah. Mean, yeah, that yeah. ground. And now yeah. it's all flat and I mean that park is there and all that. So I remember those days. I mean when uh, we used to go for uh, these uh, tents, uh, I mean tent uh, shops, have a good cup of coffee and all that. Then uh, it was all just demolished. Then it came to the other side of the Mohan Singh place. I mean uh, the, the state emporiums are there and all that. So okay. there are also uh, there. I am talking about you know somewhere in 1970. <laughs> But I have met you in uh, Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, I think I met you. Oh, one... yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, you reminded me. I mean, that was the last, uh, I think, uh, uh, event that we organized yeah. with Rajiv Gandhi Institute. I huh. remember exactly. I think you were also there. And, I was. Uh, but, but I think you came for a different uh, session. Uh, that was uh, some soft power diplomacy. Some, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody... actually, I was about to leave for UAE for my field research, and uh, Professor Pasha, who is my supervisor, was supposed to come for the event. Okay. So he couldn't manage, so he asked me to go for the event. Okay, okay. So I don't know, I can just I can recollect. I mean, you were there. I think you also spoke of it. Then I think we had an exchange of notes. Then uh, we yeah. said that we'll be keeping in touch. 
and you know later on uh, mr mahajan asked me to organize a one day conference yeah. on uh, india us relations huh. and we had a full pleasure you know whole day uh, discussion on india us relations where we invited uh, your uh, jnu uh, professor mahapatra okay. uh, uh, he was there and bezinal uh, katoch he was there deepan raj choudhary was there and uh, you know popular uh, journalist uh, ishwita sharma from yeah. tv9 she was also there yeah. so they spoke uh, on uh, india us relations that was the first uh, you know uh, event that uh, we organized on the request of rajiv gandhi institute and we were to hold uh, nine such uh, events but because of covid <laughs> everything yeah, everything was but this is an excellent um, initiative you which you have taken like the foreign policy school it's really really doing well i like, like i i also have colleagues who have come here i think miss amin uh, anima puri has also spoken yeah yeah, yeah. yeah she has spoken earlier uh, so far we have recorded more than 75 you know lectures that's a huge number i am really thankful to all the you know the diplomats academics media persons analysts they have very very kindly agreed to spare time you know it mm-hmm. requires a lot of preparation when you mm-hmm. speak for such a uh, gathering mm-hmm. and uh, i was fortunate enough that um, they all cooperated with me and uh, this, uh, you can see the and uh, you know all these uh, uh, 75 have been uh, put on uh, youtube mm-hmm. they have all been I've, i've seen that yeah. i've seen that and uh, i tell you um, when this uh, november uh, uh, lectures are over we will put them edit them and then we will put it on youtube so they are a permanent use to the students and oh, okay. they will help uh, the indian students to understand and you know we have this certificate course uh, in the sense that uh, we invite few students they join mm. us not only from india from also from abroad who are really mm. interested I, i don't pick up a crowd i just pick up a, a small uh, gathering of intelligent mm. students who understand mm. things and secondly who can put intelligent questions to you i mean mm. the mm. speaker uh, feels very encouraged when intelligent questions are put to uh, the speaker and uh, they feel that uh, our labor has not gone waste so mm. this is the objective behind it and uh, as you know our objective is to uh, train these uh, young university students to understand first the uh, Uh, intricacies of uh, making of indian foreign policy implementation of it mm-hmm. then only i think they can explain things on social media or any other thing absolutely so this, is the this is the actually platform this is the beginning i mean we expect them to understand us mm-hmm. so with the help of all you i think uh, we have been able to uh, uh, achieve all this uh, and uh, Uh, this will continue i mean i you know uh, i have i think uh, you must have read uh, i have proposed to ugc okay about a masters course in indian foreign policy exclusively oh. devoted to india's foreign policy okay diplomacy foreign relations india's role in india uh, i mean international and regional organization then there could be dissertation then there could be foreign languages course and all that so i have written to the chairperson i mean chairman uh, uh, and uh, let us hope if that yeah. comes out of course we will not be in a position to undertake that course because we are not a higher education institution we mm-hmm. are a research organization and if they permit uh, i think i uh, we can run it but uh, under the rules i think uh, they will uh, give it to some university or some higher education institution but even then we feel satisfied that what we have proposed is uh, big recognized and i have got very good uh, response from you know uh, academics and other persons from abroad if you look mm. at my website they have uh, written to me you can read their comments they have welcomed it indian diplomats have welcomed it that is this is something uh, which we have never thought of that there could be a full pledged course on <laughs> indian diplomacy mm. all that so this is what we are trying to do and let us hope with the cooperation of all of you we will be able to so uh, dr shesha uh, without mm-hmm. taking we have talked uh, too much about uh, 
uh, other, uh, I mean, related issues of food. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, before I ask you to begin, I would like to welcome you and uh, I would like to thank you for sparing time. And uh, we hope that our students will benefit from uh, what you say about subject. Because Indian cultural diplomacy is something which is uh, very, very, uh, I mean, vital. And uh, you know, Joseph and I, uh, father of, of our diplomacy, uh, I mean, you know, he also writes for us, for our FPRC general. Oh, wow. I mean, person like, I mean, Joseph Nye can spare time for us. This is really something wonderful. And once I wrote to him, mm. sir, how could you find time for us? Ah. And you know, he's very busy. So he said, I do it for you simply because you are working for a good cause. And yeah. that's why, I mean, we feel satisfied. So now please uh, go ahead with your address. Thank you. So should I start, sir? Okay. So hello, students. My name is Dr. Sreshtha Chakraborty. I am an assistant professor at the Manav Rachna International Institute of Research and Studies. I hold um, my PhD in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University. My PhD is on India's cultural relations with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, so it's uh, uh, so the lecture today that I'm going to del del deliver is basically a, a part of my PhD thesis. So to start my lecture, that is on India's cultural diplomacy, uh, I'll say that my uh, entire lecture is divided into two sections. In the first section, we look into the theoretical framework of cultural diplomacy and how it has evolved over the years in India. And in the second section, we deal with different structures, frameworks, and instrumentalities and look into the role of the Ministry of Culture and the Indian Cul Council of Cultural Relations. So, so uh, also at the end, we're going to deal with different tools of cultural diplomacy like Bollywood, yoga, art and literature, music, sports. And these are different tools which has been used by the Indian uh, 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 by the by by Indians. Uh, so, what is cultural diplomacy, and where does it find its place in the diplomatic arena? These are the two very important questions. And is it uh, to promote understanding among people and nations through an understanding of different culture, or how do we define culture when using it as a diplomatic tool? So. Cultural relations, in, if you see, it grows organically and naturally without uh, any government intervention. The transaction of trade and tourism, student flow, communications, book circulation, migration, media access, and intermarriages, um, a million of other uh, cross-cultural encounters are, are very, very, very vital for such development. If that is correct, cultural diplomacy is said to take place when formal diplomats serving na national governments uh, uh, basically try to shape and channel this natural flow to advance the natu uh, national interest. But this was true in the 20th century, but does not stand the test of cultural diplomacy, which is pursued in the 21st century, where diplomats and non-diplomats crisscross in using culture in promoting national interests. Now, uh, uh, be it individually or jointly or with the support of the government, uh, maybe morally or financially and etc. So, uh, Cultural diplomacy in the modern context can be defined as the use of creative expressions and ideas, informations, and people to increase mutual understanding. This is where cultural diplomacy is a broader concept and it differs from soft power. So uh, is it about the victory of, it, it is not about the victory of A over B, but about connecting A with B. So generating understanding about each other, resulting in binding mutual trust and paving way for the promotion of the relationship. So the ultimate thing in cultural diplomacy is about understanding and is more 
people centric and it aims to create an atmosphere of trust building so cultural diplomacy is the promotion of understanding among people and nations through trust i would view it as uh, culture connectivity communication and cooperation so where communication is the key element of cultural diplomacy it is the culture that provides this connectivity bridge and it is the communication that leads to this cooperation so the need of such an understanding becomes more pronounced in this globalized world so therefore it becomes a process of this 5c that is culture cooperation connectivity conversation and communication so the history of cultural diplomacy can be traced to early travelers traders religious preachers and seafarers artists and teachers who could be placed in the category of cultural ambassadors themselves so for example in india the nalanda university was a living example that facilitated such cultural interaction so cultural diplomacy has the formidable task of creating understanding as it aims at changing the mindset so it helps in building trust results in the opening of doors and it creates an environment that is conducive to promoting peace and friendship so it's not about conflict or it's not about imposition it's about peace friendship understanding trust building so that is the core of cultural relation uh, cultural diplomacy so cultural diplomacy is not only about promoting cultural exchange it exchanges but the process also results in promoting the image of the nation so that is therefore both a vehicle as well as the end product seen in projecting an image of a country so uh, a nature um, so if you say a natural by product and result is that it ultimately promotes diplomatic relations also it facilitates commercial uh, political strategic and other fields so what defines culture in cultural diplomacy in the narrower context it means performing arts like you know uh, dance music and etc while on the broader context it means a whole way of life in a society for the purpose of this lecture we are accepting a broader definition of culture that is uh, that was adopted by unesco in 1982 Uh, so i read this uh, it says that culture compri uh, comprises the whole complex of distinctive spiritual material intellectual and emotional features that uh, characterizes a society or social group it includes not only art and letters but also the modes of life the fundamental rights of the human being value system traditions and beliefs so it's basically comprises of very complex distinctive spiritual material and intellectual features therefore culture in the context of nation state results in acquiring a personality of their own so each nation thus acquires a distinctive personality and a national stereotype at times such stereotypes are in variance with reality as it is the perception that matters so this results in nations getting branded as per the national stereotype as they are uh, as they are often perceived by others so some image lingers uh, like american hegemon indian elephant uh, chinese dragon so these are some of the stereotypes which have come into the international scenario sometimes such stereotypes motivates the promotion of particular interests of the state so any discussion on cultural diplomacy would necessitate our understanding on how it is placed vis-a-vis -vis the similar concept like soft power public diplomacy which are very much in vogue in today's time are they similar if not how they relate to one another this is the question that we should ask so cultural diplomacy in the modern day context appears in the 1930s when 
President uh, Roosevelt was trying to woo the American audiences. So public diplomacy, so this is where cultural diplomacy emerged and public diplomacy appeared on the scene in the 1960s, whose guiding spirit was uh, in the, in the, the was uh, Edward Murrow, who was a director of the United States Information Agency. Uh, and he gave the practical imp uh, implementation, whereas the theoretical uh, framework was provided by Edward Gullier. He is basically the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. The concept of soft power was ushered in by Joseph Nye in the 1990s. So when we talk about soft power, it is a very new concept. It's only emerged in the 1990s. So, but cultural diplomacy has been there for a very long time. So President Roosevelt uh, found inherent strength in cultural diplomacy in connecting with people through cultural exchanges. So he wanted to send a message of friendship and brotherhood to them. So soft power grew out of conviction and necessity that hard power alone could not solve the growing complexities of the post-Cold War international relations, as there were limitations to what soft power could achieve. So Nye basically used another term in which he uh, uh, judicially mixed both hard power and soft power. And that term is called the smart power, which was developed to encounter the misperception that soft power alone cannot produce effective foreign policy. To understand India's approach to cultural diplomacy, it is therefore essential to appreciate how culture has become an integral part of the life of the people as well as nation. So Indian approach to the world is through the acceptance of this philosophy that is the whole world is a family. And it is defined by the idea of India, which means accepting a composite inclusive culture. It has been nurtured and enriched over the years through a process of acculturation. It thus, uh, it, 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 it has its, uh, it, its ethos in this pluralistic society. And uh, it also upholds secularism and democracy. So the seed of the Indian cultural diplomacy was planted by Jawaharlal Nehru in the Asian Relation Conference, which was held in April 1947 in New Delhi. The conference was held at uh, his initiative and he underscored the importance of cultural diplomacy in bringing about understanding among people. In his inaugural address, at the setting of, up of the ICSSR in 1950s, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru stated that the heart of the activities of ICSR would be to promote understanding of each other in the independent, interdependent world. So a similar message was reiterated by P.V. Narsimha Rao when he delivered the 1994 Singapore uh, lecture on Indian cultural heritage. So if we see, over the years, cultural diplomacy is acquiring a new dimension as it has been viewed as uh, the soft power of a country to reinforce the strategic foreign interest of the country. So prime, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh saw India's soft power, uh, power as increasingly important element in our experience, expanding global footprint. So the principal body, that is the ICCR, was mandated to oversee this cultural diplomacy globally. Uh, so in the next context, we can see that, uh, so, so go, going back to how India's cultural diplomacy evolved over the years under various prime ministers, it was Jawaharlal Nehru who set the ball rolling for India's cultural diplomacy. He outlined the approach which was uh, even prior to India's ind independence. He saw cultural diplomacy as a vehicle for promoting understanding among people. Uh, uh, so in this, he was also helped by Maulana Azad, who was the then the in, uh, India's education and culture minister. Uh, next came uh, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, who focused uh, whose focus was mainly on the vehicle of art and dance and the and and uh, festivals so 
he was the first prime minister who held uh, the festival in uk in 1982 and the focus was primarily on art and culture then came rajiv gandhi who continued with the tradition of the festival of india uh, and it was more or less unchanged then came prime minister bajpai who had a very different background and ideologies and he also more or less did not intervene or did not change rather uh, it, it 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 continued in the same way uh, pv narsimha rao manmohan singh again took the nehruvian approach the major change and major thrust in the foreign policy came with the coming of the power of prime minister modi who has been deliberately using indian diaspora as a soft power medium then uh, this has been a background which i have uh, created and i have given how it has evolved and how what has been the approach of different uh, different uh, prime ministers of india then we talk about the framework of india's cultural diplomacy so the ministry of external affairs is the nodal ministry that oversees india's cultural diplomacy this responsibility is shared with the ministry of culture and also uh, ministry of external affairs is involved in both the formulation and execution of cultural diplomacy it does this through the iccr as we have already uh, discussed and there is another uh, division called the public Di diplomacy division which was set up in 2006 uh, it also performed functions some of which also fell in the realm of uh, cultural diplomacy but it, it was mainly established to promote india's uh, cult uh, like different aspects of different uh, india's culture internationally so later in 2014 it again got renamed into external publicity and public diplomacy division so then came ministry of culture who basically uses this two instrument that is cultural agreement and cultural exchange program to develop uh, various uh, aspects so cultural agreement provides the framework for the pursuit of cultural re relations and covers areas such as sports education mass media youth affairs etc and uh, cep that is the uh, the the programs which are in the nature of annual programs of activities in different fields are uh, are basically mutual agreed upon between two countries uh, and different facets of cultural diplomacy gets executed so in keeping with the indian uh, government's broad policy it establishes again three nodal academies which also takes care of the cultural diplomacy which is the sangeet natak academy the lalit kala academy and the sahitya academy so they are very very crucial for the promotion of india's cultural diplomacy abroad then uh, we have indian council for cultural relation which has basically twin task of one promoting and second interpreting abroad indian culture so those two aspect is very very crucial so iccr is again um, uh, it's very important uh, when it comes to promotion of education education is a very important aspects in which iccr gives a lot of focus so there are about 6000 scholars who are uh, there and uh, there are 25 scholarship schemes that they also administer and on behalf of the government agencies like many other uh, countries iccr has also taken resort in setting up cultural centers abroad the focus of this center is to establish revive strengthen cultural relations and mutual understanding and to promote awareness about india's composite cultural heritage this still remains the primary focus uh so uh, as on today there are around 35 full fledged cultural centers and there is only one sub center abroad the centers are actively promoting india's soft power abroad with a wide range of activities including dance music theater yoga language talks exhibition uh, conference and seminar then iccr had 70 chairs of indian student uh, 70 chairs of indian studies uh, as on 2019 the purpose of this chair is not only to educate foreign students abroad but also to develop scholarly interactions with the academics of the country and to assist uh, in uh, in better information exchange 
so beside this chair abroad iccr also operates two chairs in india one is the nelson mandela chair which is permanently based in the jawaharlal nehru university and the other one is open to scholars for uh, uh, like and is open to scholars for africa and the second one is for the sark it and that has a rotating that that takes place on a rotating basis uh, between various universities in india so iccr runs various programs like the distinguished visitors program and the outgoing visitors program and evaluation of the role of the iccr was uh, undertaken by the parliamentary committee in uh, 1996 to 1997 and it finds mention in the second report of the standing committee on external affairs i think which was headed by uh, shashi tharoor and evaluation of the report of iccr was undertaken by the parliament as i mentioned in 96 uh, 1996 to 1997 while promoting the role of india's cultural diplomacy india's le leaders actually recognize the limits of the state becoming the sole promoter so india therefore left a window open for the involvement of the public body and non official uh, players uh, so uh, it it has also appreciated the role that has been uh, played by different organization which are not affiliated to the indian government so some cultural bodies like the india international uh, international center then um, also the indira gandhi national center for art is an autonomous body set up by the ministry of culture which plays a very very important role then uh, sark cultural center the national book trust of art and cultural heritage and other cultural centers they also are very very crucial uh, instruments now coming to the tools of cultural diplomacy so the first is education it's the main and uh, as been reiterated by the uh, iccr chairperson many a times it's the main uh, uh, tool that they have been using in today's world it's assist in learning facilitating exchanges of ideas helping in building friendships so fulbright scheme has uh, has been uh, has been projected as a shining example of education diplomacy then uh, when we talk of in the, uh, india bollywood definitely shines like whether it's uh, like uh, film stars they have their huge impact so it's inseparable these two words like whenever you go abroad in dubai and all that just bollywood any personality they can quickly uh, recognize then there is yoga art music dance ayurveda they are also taking major they are also playing a major role then sports has been uh, always been a form of soft power in terms of promoting national brand or identity and itself has been used by nations to promote products and culture we have seen this uh, at the time of beading for holding the olympic games or the commonwealth games how important it becomes for a country then indian food come uh, to be a very important player like the curry culture like uh, whenever we go to europe it's a very common thing to say spicy dish curry culture of india which is basically a way of promoting india's culture abroad therefore not surprising to see bbc emerging as a as a promoter as well they have an entire series of indian cuisine they launched it in 2016 their entire program on indian food and culture then photo photographic uh, exhibition then regional cinema is being very important uh, and the most crucial out of them is the diaspora so the strategic asset uh, it can be said it's like a strategic asset for any any uh, for india it is uh, the fact that diaspora engagement in both it engages with both home and the host state so it becomes very important for india such an engagement was institutionalized somewhat in 2003 when india held its first diaspora conference called the pravasi bharatiya divas and uh, it was to mark the return of mahatma gandhi to india on january 1950 so since 2014 uh, the ministry of overseas affairs has set a number of appropriate like bodies to enhance the diasporic uh, involvement in a range of activities and uh, diaspora is very very important for both the host country and uh, also for india so another question is what is the way ahead what should be done the need is to be like there is a like 
there are various levels in which it can be answered, but I would put it in a very macro level perspective. First is partnership building with other countries. It's the most important thing. The key cultural diplomacy, uh, the key cultural diplomacy vehicles um, needs to be promoted. Then developing synergy with different cultural body, enhancing the function even more of ICCR because uh, it has not, it has to give competition to the Chinese counterpart at various levels. Then cultural diplomacy has to be insulated uh, by political, so whatever happens, whenever a political, like there's a political change, there's always a change in the approach, how it uses cultural diplomacy. So it has to be carefully monitored. However, it should be kept in mind that cultural diplomacy is a very people centric process and a process that could help reach out directly to people across the borders. So I think I will end it here and uh, I'll take up questions and, and then from there I can discuss even more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shesta. I mean, uh, you have left no ground uncovered. I mean, you have right from political aspects to the practical uh, side of cultural diplomacy, the organization in India uh, who was handling this and how it has developed uh, through the various uh, prime ministerships of uh, India. Every prime minister had his own vision about uh, promoting India's cultural diplomacy. And all. I am reminded of uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. You know, when he went to Lahore, uh, he had taken uh, film stars like Devanand. You mm -hmm. know, to, <laughs> because you know, Devanand belongs to former Pakistan area, and mm -hmm. he is very popular not only in India but also there. So our leaders have been very very careful about uh, promoting cultural diplomacy and it has a very wide uh, reach and it helps you know in normalizing relations where hard power doesn't work sometimes you know soft power works uh, very comfortably so you have covered all these things and uh, now i will ask uh, i think ria is there uh, ria would you like to ask any questions yes sir yes sir yeah, yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, first of all, thank you so much for the very interesting lecture. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm Riya Sharma and currently I'm pursuing my master's in political science. Ma'am, my question was that uh, peace and humanity are values that are seen something uh, seen as something woven into a very cultural fabric. And India has been quite vocal about it in the international forums. But ma'am, don't you think that the recent steps taken by the government, such as the CAA, NRC, or the take on uh, the Rohingya crisis, they are a kind of setback to our soft diplomatic relations with uh, respect to our neighbors, neighboring countries? Yeah, I. Uh, if you ask me, yeah, definitely uh, it has created. Like if you are saying, so when it comes to creating a brand for itself, India has already created a brand and it's not a new one. It's It's been there for a quite a long time. But what has happened recently is uh, it has start get, it, it, it's, it's getting noticed for having certain nationalist sentiment. So I think it has become a big challenge because uh, we know how it uh, hampered the relation between India and the Gulf nations with certain statements made. So, uh, but I don't think because, you know, I think the Indian diasporic value is so strong in such nation, like people already know at the heart of like Indian diaspora has never caused any trouble to any country uh, as of now. So I think more like recent incidents would not hamper the age old cultural relations which have been there for centuries. So I think, yeah, even if there is a small uh, no, sometimes there is a rift between countries because of certain policies, but it's not going to take a huge toll on its soft power image or soft cultural diplomacy. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, also uh, just recently uh, there was this news about Chinese people uh, singing the Jimmy Jimmy song, uh, yeah. which in Chinese translates to give me rice because of the shortage of uh, essential food items they're facing uh, because of the lockdown. Also, ma'am, uh, Bollywood celebrities like Amitabh Bachchan or Shah Rukh Khan, and they are, as you said, they are globally celebrated personalities. Yeah. But ma'am, don't you think somewhere uh, this uh, soft part potential of Bollywood is not uh, fully utilized? 
ma'am yeah. i mean we can uh, we can uh, use this platform to promote not only uh, no north indian culture but also a rich culture of uh, northeast and the far south i'll tell you a small example from my life incident so in the year 2017 i have been to palestine and i went to west bank i was in jericho for around a month and uh, suddenly i was walking in the street and it's very like you know you can't walk in the street of jericho all the time but when i was given a permission i was walking and suddenly someone noticed and uh, she just walked up to me and she's like oh you're an indian because i don't i think i i look distinctly very indian so he's like oh i'm like, yeah i am so like, oh, do you know shahrukh khan and i am like no india is quite a huge country and i don't know but yeah i know him through the television as you know also <laughs> so uh, i would say that yeah the impact is wide and i don't think it's the government uh, i think government here has just act as a facilitator it is the people to people contact which has created this and in terms of bollywood i would say see already if you see uae it has been promoting its tourism by using uh bollywood celebrities like uh if you see shahrukh khan is the brand ambassador of the dubai tourism and vicky mm -hmm. kaushal is for abu dhabi so i think the countries actually know how how to use bollywood because it's inseparable like uh india means they automatically think it's amitabh bachchan and shahrukh khan it's the first thing that comes to their mind so and uh, actually shahrukh khan ensures a lot of footfall for the dubai tourism like when shahrukh khan comes on screen and say be, be my guest dubai tourism actually knows how many guests he is inviting from india or across the world or that's why it was birthday you could see a long burj khalifa they projected him so he must have got uh, some uh, revenues for them yeah. ma'am uh, you mentioned one point ma'am uh, that uh... a soft part the soft part diplomacy began in 1990s but uh, the cultural diplomacy existed since uh, long times back ma'am i just wanted to share something i read ma'am i read that uh, india's uh, soft part uh, uh, diplomacy or this uh, culture began long back in 1893 when one narendra that is the real name of swami vivekanand ji he spoke in the parliament of world religions about peace and yoga and today we have another narendra that is our pm narendra modi advocating india soft culture globally in international so yeah so i personally think uh, in today's the government that we have now have given a lot of focus in cultural diplomacy because i won't say that it wasn't there but it was not fully utilized by but the present government has definitely tapped into the indian diaspora and the when when the entire stadium was shouting howdy modi it actually reflected how they are connecting and to be very honest they for a very long time they they were not addressed properly i think the present government has definitely tapped into them yeah thank you so much ma'am yeah thank you uh that is just uh, uh, i am reminded of the uh, 1950s mm. uh, when uh, uh, you know that song mera juta hai japani it was uh, dil hai hindustani rusi and all that so it mm. was very popular in uh, russia i mean the soviet union i mean uh, chakravarti was an icon in Ra russia for a very long time that's the reason that actor also speaks very fluent russian uh, yeah, because, yeah. yeah. so um, films have been a very good vehicle of uh, promoting uh, india's cultural diplomacy uh, yeah. since long and uh, i think uh, we should do all our best to uh, use this uh, you know medium uh, to promote uh, cultural diplomacy and that will bring uh, the nations uh, nearer to us uh, yeah. dr shesha i mean i would like to ask you something about your you know work on uh, india and ue and mm -hmm. ua is now uh, known more for you know business uh, strategic you know um, cooperation investments in india and all that they are having a planning a airlines from uh, jammu and kashmir and all that so um, how do you look at the, you know, the, the cultural relations between india and ua i mean that is the focus of your work and all that would you like to uh, i mean a little more on that yeah sir in my work i actually have uh, 
appointed around 18 vehicles of India's cultural diplomacy with UAE and in which I have mainly focused on the Indian diaspora. It's huge. It's 3.3. And if you like, if someone visits the older part of Dubai, they would be saying that it's like a mini India. So it speaks for itself from local food joints to the businesses. Like if one goes to the, to takes that Abra ride, they would see only Indian faces. And those are basically businessmen. So from uh, the like Lulu group to their tire companies, everyone, like there are uh, more than 1000 uh, you know, companies in the uh, uh, JBR area. And those are all Indians. Apart from that tourism, Indians are give the highest footfall for them. And, and if, if you ask me, I think Dubai more than uh, Dubai and India's relation goes way back uh, in uh, when they started the trade relation where these Shikhapuri traders, the Hyderabadi traders, they migrated and Dubai emerged as an important hub after uh, Iran, uh, the port of Iran it, it started taxing them and Dubai asked them to come and visit and made the entire port tax free for any kind of trade. So if you ask me, I think if one has to understand India UAE's relation, it has to be historical and it has to go back that far back into how this people to people trade relation flourished and it invited more ideas. And then on the basis of that, the basis of the trust that both the countries have built for each other, the other relationship flourish. So I would say it's a two way, like the economic and the investment that is happening is also a result of the uh, long trust that these two countries have on each other. So that's my, that's my understanding. And the governments are just the facilitator. It's the people who have nourished and flourished this entire relations. Uh, you are right uh, uh, to great extent. Uh, I'm also reminded uh, of, you know, another uh, field of uh, uh, cooperation between India and UAE. That is, when nations uh, don't have uh, very good relations, uh, particularly in the field of sports, games and sports, they prefer to have their matches in uh, Dubai. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Indian team doesn't uh, go to Pakistan. Pakistan cricket team doesn't come uh, to India uh, for uh, obvious reasons and all that. But they uh, like to play in Dubai. They say that it is a neutral, you know, venue, and uh, all those, you know, euphoria and all that, you know, uh, is not there. I mean, and uh, diaspora from Pakistan, from India, are all there, but they have a, a little different approach to all the, 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 the matches we have seen and all that. So uh, the UAE has also become a center of, you know, <laughs> so uh, peaceful, I, uh, I personally think, sir, uh, Sharjah has been the important ground for all of this because Sharjah has seen lots of and lots of matches between India and Pakistan, unless it, it got into some controversy. And also there is this uh, big rise of sporting events among the Gulf, Gulf countries. As we see the World Cup is happening in Qatar. I think UAE and Qatar being an opponent, like they they've always they, they compete with each other. They're also both the countries are trying to promote uh, their sports arena. They're investing massively. And we can see the IPL recently happening, like almost all the T20 matches they take to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and they play from there. So yeah, definitely sports and especially if you talk sports, I think cricket. Cricket has a very important role uh, when it comes to India and UAE's relations. Yeah, I mean, uh, during uh, COVID-19 period, I mean, IPL had to be shifted to uh, <laughs> that country. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, um, cricketers were happy. People were also happy that they could see the match on the television and all that because, you know, the problems here in uh, India and all that. So that way, UAE has been a savior. I yeah. mean, for India and and that country is getting a lot of revenue from all these activities. Absolutely, a lot of revenue. I mean, they have invested a lot and they are earning a lot. Yeah, absolutely, sir. So, uh, Dr. Shesha, thank you very much for a very lively discussion on the subject and yeah. your uh, personal experiences uh, about India UAE. Uh, cultural, uh, I mean, the contacts and all that. And uh, we hope the students will enjoy this uh, talk. And uh, if there are any questions more, we, I will email to them if they have forwarded to me. 
and uh, we hope to have your cooperation in the future also uh, when uh, occasion demands uh, i hope you will not disappoint us no, and no, uh, so thank you very much and once again i would like to uh, thank you uh, thank for a wonderful session so with your permission i would like to close the session now so thank you very much thank you